so theater is a rotten business. It's a rotten business. It costs $9 million to put on a musical. It costs $3 million to put on a straight play. It's a rotten business. And I don't know why anybody does it. I've done 15 Broadway shows. Now, what have I done? I've done the Candor and Ebb show. I've done the Richard Rogers show. I did 1776, which was 80% dialogue. That was the Sherman Edwards show. I've done, uh, uh, and you go right down the list. I'm now doing the Maury Eston show. Now, Maury's the composer, and he's done a wonderful job. But I've seen it referenced in the press now two or three or four times as the Maury Eston show in the New York Times and Variety and so forth. It's, you start to think people don't know what a libretto is or a book. Libretto is not the world's famous, <laughs> most favorite word, in this, which is what, because operas, it's sort of the scenario. Operas for a libretto. But the fact is, nobody knows, including the critics, what a, a book writer, they think it's the jokes. Well, you know it's not the jokes. The actors make those up as they go along. It's got <laughs> to be the structure. And musical, more than anything else, you've got two duties as a book writer. One, tell two hours worth of story in one hour because the score is not going to help you tell the story. And the other is to facilitate the score uh, because it's still a musical. Right. But when you're on, you are on at what you've mostly done. When I did Will Rogers' Follies, everybody said, well, there is no book. Well, it was entirely book. It's concept. It was, it was book it, from beginning to end. Structure, concept, and, it, and, that, and that's what it is. Right. So I'll tell you a fast rule. You can get a great score and a bad book, you will not have a hit, ever. Mm -hmm. You can get a great book and a mediocre score, anyway. and you will most likely win. It's very difficult to say why a show works and doesn't work. Uh, there are elements, subcutaneous elements, below the surface <laughs> that you can't even guess at. People say, how can you do it? How can professionals who have been successful and who have been at it all these years get together, a group of them, and then produce a show that doesn't work. And the fact is, it's very easy. The elements, there are so many elements, and there's such a surprise when you see them up on the stage finally together. Not just the book and the, mu and the score together with an orchestra and with the cast and the sets and the... It's a surprise. Uh, you know, I have a, uh, a rule of thumb. I can't discuss what happened, right or wrong, until I no longer have the entire show memorized. <laughs> it's true. You, by the time a show opens, you know every line in it. You can lie in bed and do the show from beginning to end. You've seen it so many times. Um, well, Peter, these, uh, uh, these are really the Peter Stone days on Broadway. I mean, you have as many shows as uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber with 1776 and Titanic. Uh, I know you've had a lot of success in the past, but uh, I mean, do you feel that you are now in your halcyon days as a Broadway uh, writer? And oh, as I heard someone say the other day on television, my helicon days. <laughs> I, well, it's a good time. I mean, these are both show that was my first Tony and my last Tony and uh, and uh, you won the Tony for book for Titanic and yeah, yeah. And, and on 1776 both shows won best show mm -hmm. both you know they're both uh, uh, quite they, they have similarities uh, they're both historically based dealing with fact in the musical uh, in a musical uh, style a musical genre but but uh, they, they, they it's the first show I've done since well Will Rogers had a bit of it um, the, the, the life of Will Rogers, that dealt a good deal with, with fact as well, but not to the extent. That one was tricked up to be a Ziegfeld show. It was his life as Ziegfeld would have done it. Right. You, you know, this is the Titanic as it happened and, and the signing of the Declaration uh, as it happened. Um, the, the facts of 1776 are very, very strongly based in this show. There's very little... Uh, very little uh, poetic strength. license. Yeah. yeah, there's a good deal of poetic license, but not with the facts. <laughs> we should say for those who haven't seen it, the protagonist of 1776 is John Adams and Franklin and, and Franklin. Jefferson. But everybody dislikes John Adams, which apparently was true. Well, dislikes him personally. They, the expression at the time 
when he, that he was obnoxious and disliked, but they respected him. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, or not, depending, you'll be the judge of that, uh, Richard Nixon admired John Adams more than anybody else uh -huh. because when, after the war was won, they, or during the, the period uh, when the war was going on, there was the thing called the Boston Massacre where British soldiers fired into a crowd of mm -hmm. Americans. They killed five. It was still called a massacre. Brent, Kent State was four. They didn't call it a massacre <laughs> because we, right. we'd run out of. By then, hyperbole was changed. But, the, but, and the um, the soldiers were arrested and tried, and they were terrible. They were almost lynched. Mm -hmm. And John Adams went in and defended them under the principle that everybody is entitled to a spirit of defense, and um, even Richard Nixon. <laughs> so I think that's why he admired him more than, more than anybody else. Also, though, I think Adams, at least in, in, in your um, uh, interpretation of him, is ex extremely bright, but also dark and, 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 and brooding and prickly, a little bit, I think, like, well, quite a bit like Nixon was. Well, there, there are great differences. Yeah. Um, Adams was a scrupulously uh, 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 legitimate Man, I mean, he was scrupulously uh, didn't have uh, a tape recorder around either. Uh, <laughs> honest is the word I don't like to use, but but it was, uh, but he certainly was. His integrity was beyond question, mm -hmm. and uh, but Adams was a driving force. His energy was a driving force. Certainly, Franklin's authority, because he was the oldest man by but one in the Congress. He he was an accomplished man. And he had a great, he was a venerable character, and he had a great deal of influence. And a popular author, Benjamin Franklin. Yes, yes. yes. And a printer, and uh, many yeah. other. It's re remarkable is that all these men had many professions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there was the young Jefferson, still untried, un 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 you know, uh, who, as Adams himself says, they made him write it because he wrote ten times better than any man in Congress, right. including Adams, as Adams said. Right. He had a happy talent for composition, and um, and uh, he he was he was uh, a very graceful man with a pen. And, but he's also an architect. He was also uh, uh, you know a, a, a great a bon vivant with the slaves. Well, that was later <laughs> in his not life. In there, right? <laughs> not at this point. But no. He, but you. But it is. A show also about the molding of a writer, about Jefferson emerging as this well as a kind of writer, yes, yes. And uh, but it's really about the the problems of getting the country started, which somehow those problems they're not taught. It was a great puzzlement to me for a long time to why they're not taught, why they weren't taught. I was a pretty good history student in, in all through high school and college. <laughs> I didn't know a lot about it, and it's our national myth. I mean, it's our national legend. I, I didn't know a great deal about it. I knew that they had cardboardized all of these characters, yes. with, and they weren't human. No, uh, they were they were mythic, and um, that part. But I also knew about five names who had signed. I knew I, I knew Hancock because it was that large the big one, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I knew Button Gwinnett somehow because it was the rarest one at the autograph houses because he'd only signed one other thing in his life. <laughs> but I didn't know who anybody else was. I didn't know what what was going on at the time. I didn't realize that the that the country was, in a sense, divided in three separate and different sections. That the the colonies, the the four New England colonies, were very very. Uh, political and very even radical. The four Middle Atlantic colonies were very, very conservative and business-like. They were, they did, they handled the mercantile. And, right. and they, you, you certainly show that the forces of conservatism have not changed. No. <laughs> well, there's an interesting story about that. But they also the four Southern colonies were agrarian and slaveholders. And interesting. Yeah. It was their peculiar institution, as right. they called it. Only Virginia stood apart as the nobility of the of the colonies. And whenever you wanted to do anything that would get the, the, the other colonies to agree, you always got a Virginian to do it, to lead the army. You got Washington to propose independence. You got Richard Henry Lee to write the declaration. You got uh, Jefferson and, and, and so forth. And, um, because they were the only ones people would go along with? They, were, they had a kind of standing, a kind of respect. Mm -hmm. the, the whole colony was the or aristocracy of, mm -hmm. the, of the colonies and, and uh, of the other colonies. And they, they, but if you want to accomplish something, Patrick anyway. Henry yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so forth, you, you got one of, uh, one of them. Uh, and, um, but uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the 
eastern, the, the Atlantic, middle Atlantic colonies. 1776 played the Nixon White House uh, back in 1970, I think. And later, when Jack Warner, who was the head of the Warner Brothers, uh, made the film, it wasn't made, he didn't make it at Warner Brothers, but he, he, he had left Warner Brothers, but he was one of the original founding members, and he produced this film. He never produced anything else in his life as a hands-on producer, he'd just been a studio head. Nixon called him. Now, Nixon and he had a relationship dating back to the beginning of the blacklist, when all the studio heads all caved in mm -hmm. uh, because they, they didn't want trouble. And um, they had a bit of a relationship, and Nixon told him to cut out the conservative number. The men to were, the were, right, always, always to, to the, the right, right never, never to the left. left. It was a minuet danced yeah. by the... Very uh, powerful number. Very right? powerful number. And Nixon asked him to cut it out, and he did cut it out. And to make certain it was out, he burnt the negative. <laughs> and the film was released without it, uh, to its uh, detriment. However, later, when they went to do the first, the um, laser disc, um, the, the people who, who did the disc uh, went on searching for it and found a positive, not a negative, in the film vaults, in the salt caverns of Utah or Colorado, wherever they're kept, and um, actually found a positive of it and inserted it in the film. And now it's back in the video oh, cassette. Well, now let, let's take a look at, at them doing this. The, it's the cool, considerate man at, yes. at the roundabout. Yes. Come ye cool, cool, considerate set. We'll dance together to the same minuet. To the right, never to the right, never to the left, forever to the right. Let our creed be never to exceed regulated speed, no matter what the need. Come sing Hosanna, Hosanna. Peter, I said at the outset that a lot of uh, critics consider 1776 to be one of the best books uh, ever written for a musical. Um, do you think it's, it's your best book? And could you sort of take us through the writing process, how you were able to build suspense for something that we know the outcome of? Well, it's certainly, if, if not the best, it's certainly the longest book uh, ever written. <laughs> That's it is. why it's your favorite, right? <laughs> That's one of my favorite. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, I mean, there are, it, it, there, there's... The big scene in the Congress is 37 minutes, I think, without any musical interruption. And the end of the show is 18, 19 minutes without any, there's no music at all. Not that bothers the music, right? No, we like that. We <laughs> book writers in the Association of Book Writers, none of whom has ever made, you must understand, the Musical Hall of Fame, I mean the Theatrical Hall of Fame, in the lobby of the Gershwin Theater, where it would have served me right if I had to look at it every night. Everybody I've ever worked with, everybody. Is the, there. The, the sound men are there. You know, the directors, everybody. No book writers ever made. So that's to my... This was a, it was a labor of inspiration as well as love, and I don't remember a lot of, about writing it, uh, except that I was driven to do it. Well, who's I looked, I, you know, whose idea well, was it, yours or Sherman Edwards? Sherman Edwards had the idea of doing this show, and he had written He was a, a composer. He's he was composer. the composer. Uh, he died uh, several years ago, but he, this was his only work, and he was wonderful. He was a wonderful man, not unlike John Adams in many ways. He was very irascible. He, had, he was very uh, outspoken. He didn't worry about niceties much. Uh, and he was very, very, very involved in this. And um, when I went in to hear the show, I didn't hold on. I mean, the idea appealed to me about as much as it appealed to anybody at that time. A, a show called 1776, uh, you know, I used to tell people and they were asleep before I said six, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was not easy. Uh, but um, he, when I said, went in to hear the score and he sat down at the piano this, and played, sit down, John, sit down, John, in a very raspy, un, not very interesting musical voice, the whole show became clear. I say, vote yes, no. vote yes, no. vote for independence, say, someone on the And and um, and so everybody who came on uh, came aboard the director, the designers, the actors all got the same sense. And when you're all doing the same show, it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, one of the great faults in doing shows is that you're not always all the elements, all the collaborators are not always doing the same, uh, are on the same level as Frank Lesser used to call it. Yeah, and the level is is a very important thing. 
In uh, other words, on the same wavelength, the same sort of working on the same yeah, playbook? It's a hard way to, yes, uh, exactly. They're all really doing the same show. I've done shows where everybody was doing a different show. Well, they, well, didn't, they didn't know that, and we, didn't, we, we sort of knew it. They didn't. Uh, but they, they were off doing something, so, and it never actually worked. Was everybody doing the same show with Titanic? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're great similarities. Now, uh, but let me answer your right. question yeah. about, let me answer the one question about the suspense. The, the, the thing that fascinates me most about theater, and it exists a great deal more than in film, because film d uh, commands uh, uh, believability, but, but, but the theater, because of its conventions, um, it's a it's a very false place to start with, but there is a there is a natural craving for storytelling in people, and especially for theater, having it acted out for them. And so they ha they every human being contains the ability to suspend disbelief, and the suspension of disbelief in the theater is an essential. And the audience that's the contract when they pay their money for a ticket. They have really paid for the opportunity to go in, sit down, and suspend their disbelief. Disbelief that there are people sitting next to them. Disbelief <laughs> that there are lights, and there's makeup, and there's scenery. And the and tickets they, are so highly pr high, high they're priced. They're not <laughs> highly priced. They're, the, they're, they, they're not. They're the same price in, re, in, in, in uh, proportion to bread and telephones <laughs> and, and right. chewing gum as they always right. were. Uh, they just, everything's right. gone up, and you're used to a time when, when you could... <laughs> but the fact is, they are. I mean, movies are nine dollars. Movies have gone up far more than film, uh, than theater in that time. Anyway, what you have to do with suspension and disbelief is get out of their way. They want to do it. Don't stop them from doing it. And 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 the same thing happens in Titanic. But the public is there to for the suspense. Now, how do you create the suspense? How did you? Well, you, you make, there are certain aids you give them, uh, that's a bad word today, certain assistance you give them to do that. For instance, I had to find out, when I had done uh, film, one of the things in film that's really uh, terrific is uh, a clock running. As a matter of fact, even when it's not seen, a clock running is, a, is an expression. And I've done film where there was actually a digital clock that kept, uh, taking a Pelham 1, 2, 3, we mm. used it, and in other film I've done. Uh, so I put the calendar there. Uh, right. Everybody knows July 4th, and you start tearing off pages, and you're getting closer and closer and closer to a date. On the other side of the stage is this tally board. It's a scorecard, and there's a scorecard of where you are. You need all 13 colonies uh, unanimous to, for this to pass. There are only seven there at the moment. You've got six to get. You've got insurmountable problems, and as one by one, these, these, these shuttles cross from the nay to the A column, and the days the leaves are falling off the calendar, right. and this thing creates it. So, so the audience wants it. And the same thing in Titanic. I hear when I go to see Titanic, and the, the man, the engineer, the man who designed it, the architect, comes upstairs to the captain, up to the bridge, uh, upstairs. And you know, I'm, I'm filled with, with, with naval lingo. You know? <laughs> right. They come upstairs to the room on top of the ship. Right? <laughs> anyway, you can tell I'm a na I've been around boats all my life. Anyway, <laughs> he comes upstairs and, he's, and the captain says, How long has she got? And he says, uh, You know, we're sinking. Ismay, the, the owner, says, God himself couldn't sink this ship. And he says, How, you know, and uh, he says, Titanic is sinking, Mr. Ismay. And the audience here, <laughs> You hear a sound, and then he says, how long have we got? He says, an hour and a half, two, maybe, most. And the audience like, they walk in knowing it. They sit there knowing it. In fact, in the opening scene of Titanic, when the entire company walks up the gangplank, the audience is well aware that most, if not all of them, right. are going to be dead. Which makes that opening scene so spectacular. Exactly. Really. So at that point, you, don't, you want to let them know that we know they know. Right. But later, we want them to go through the suspense of it. And they're more than willing to do it. They've come for that reason. That's why they come to theater, is to suspend that disbelief. And it's really important, and I'm an enormous uh, um, advocate of that, I mean, advocate of uh, a, a uh, I'm a slave to, to, the, to, the, to that concept. Uh, we're a slave to our own uh, time constraints here on the show, but I do want to touch on Titanic. Um, in a rather uh, uh, insightful piece I wrote for the Daily News about uh, how Titanic went through a very difficult preview period, turned itself around, and it is now a big hit. Um, you and I discussed your own personal experience going through that process, which I think you told me was something you'd never experienced in the theater before. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how difficult it was for you as the author of this sh troubled show to go from certain death to triumph? 
Well, it, the one thing that was really unique for me was that it was my 14th or 15th show, depending on how you count. Uh, and, um, and I'd always gone out of town with a, with a musical, which is essential, and they don't go anymore. And what happens is you stay in town and you do all of your work, you appear in your underwear in front of everybody. And it's very bad, and the press, the daily press, with the exception only of you, I, I, I'm saying that quite seriously, <laughs> We're very anxious that we fail for a reason I can understand. They wanted this show called Titanic to be as big a disaster as the original, to make theater history, to make theater lore. Um, and um, To make e jokes about the title. Yes, even you, no, you're a headline writer. It wasn't you, it was your headline <laughs> Not writer. Him. All singing, all dancing, all drowning. Right. Oh, that was and my we idea. Had to, that was, uh, Not, you know, the truth they comes sing, out. They sing, they dance, they drown. Exactly. They, Titanic hits an iceberg, Titanic yeah. won't sink, and they made up stories about our technical troubles, which we never had. Mm -hmm. We had our share of problems. But New York is a very, very, there is the, the theatrical community for reasons I don't understand, and I love them all, come to the first preview they can get to in the hopes of seeing it in the worst condition it'll ever be in, and then running around telling everybody how bad it is. Show queens on their tom-toms is the expression. Well, it's everybody. Yeah. They say, oh, guess what? I saw last night. You know, I, I was at the first preview, I guess it was Will Rogers, and a friend of mine, good friend of mine, walked in, and I said, what's wrong? You couldn't come last night? You know, it was the first preview. And he said, well, I have to go to the coast over the weekend. I said, we'll be here when you come back. You know, they have to see it, and they have to see it in the worst possible Well, they want condition. to see it grow. That's what they say, but they don't come back. Oh. I had somebody come to the first uh, thing, and he said, I, I'm a student of the musical, and I keep coming back. And I saw him about a month after, and I said, you haven't come back yet, you know. Yeah, right. Uh, oh, didn't I? No, I guess you're right. So it was unique to me, the amount of vitriol poured on the show and the amount of negativity. And it was just a show preparing to, for its opening. Every musical is in trouble out of town. Every musical. There's one only. It was Kiss Me Kate. They didn't change it. Every other show is in trouble. My Fair Lady was in trouble. Fiddler was in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, they were all, well, they were too long. They were in the wrong order. They did the change in act. They're all in trouble. But you don't want to be here where the trouble, first of all, in order to get a show out of trouble, you oftentimes have to tear it apart and put it back together again. So you'll put in a new second act, and the first act isn't even in agreement. Right. But you're in Philadelphia, or you're in Boston, it doesn't matter. You can't do that. You don't do that. Somebody's agent might be there, some producer might be there. So, so you don't do your work, really. And so, it's a very, and so for me, the most destructive thing was to be here during that period. Now you must develop a new audience because the regular theater audience, the two year for a musical, the, the 11 months for a straight play, that wasn't enough. It's not enough. And we've lost most of them because they've gone to other pursuits. So what do you have now? You've got a new audience, what they call the bridge and tunnel crowd, and they develop audiences. But audiences for what? Not for theater. Yes, for live production, but not theater. They're just as happy at the, at the, at the Paramount looking at Scrooge once a year, <laughs> or they're at the, at the, at the you know, show them a, you know, a lot of scenery and a lot of costumes and a lot of noise, and they're very happy with that. <laughs> and you know, that's what they came in for. That's all they expect out of the theater. There's no longer, they don't dress for it. They don't, they, they walk up and down the aisles during it. Mm -hmm. They eat, and as you know, this is a success-oriented city. You put the same play into a Broadway theater and there are 300 empty seats in the back and people think it's a failure because there's empty seats in the back. I heard a woman say, if I knew I could get tickets, I wouldn't have come. <laughs>